everybody. I'm Stephanie Grilly. I'm on the Yale Alumni Board of Governors and the organizer of this particular channel. Uh, I mean, it's a delight to bring Yaleys together in this virtual forum. I mean, uh, it's it's wonderful to see such a you know variety of faces, and and in fact, we encourage you, uh, given the informal nature of these conversations, we encourage you uh, to to show your video, even though we are well aware that at this hour maybe some of you are sort of multitasking, um, and we also ask because as I said, this is conversation. We ask if you have questions or comments um, that you put them in the chat. And uh, that way we can have the order. And, and also um, our guests, Brian and Bianca, can be reviewing the questions as they are uh, talking to each other. And then you will be asked to actually ask your question. Uh, so, Certainly, you know, put your question, you know, as it comes to you, because um, the first part of our show tonight, Ryan and Bianca, will, as I say, they're friends, they know each other, and they can interview each other uh, better than any of us on the actual alumni to alumni committee. Uh, but they can be looking at your questions and addressing your questions as we are moving along. Um, and I am just going to do a very brief introduction of our guests because you've come here because you've already seen their bio. Uh, but these are both uh, very well respected members of the, uh, well, we don't wanna call it the entertainment business community, but let's just say, uh, Brian being, uh, Brian Weinstein being uh, the CEO of a little um, sort of multimedia company called Bad Robot. They've done a few movies that maybe uh, you know of, you know, S Star Wars, Mission Impossible. Uh, and Bianca Levin, um, Yale College graduate, as well as the law school, uh, representing a number of uh, high profile clients that maybe you've heard of, including uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. So um, I think we have two people here who are very well placed to address the topic at hand tonight, uh, being the business behind show business. And uh, without any more ado, I, I want to hand it over to Brian and Bianca, and uh, they can run with it as they will, but I would suggest maybe you share with us, you know, how you got to where you are uh, from your path from Yale, uh, Brian and Bianca. Uh, Stephanie, thank you so much, um, and everyone, thanks so much for, for joining. Uh, you know, it's such a treat and it, it's, it's important and it feels um, really unique to be able to sit in front of uh, this world and this community and share the things we've been doing from over on the other side of the country, uh, though we're across the computer stream, we're really, we're really grateful that you've you shut up tonight. Now I have the benefit of having recruited Bianca to join me tonight, which means I get to ask her the tough questions first, see how she answers and pivot off. So though we're both in the hot seat and fire away with any questions, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that um, that I asked her, so I'm going to kick off the questions with her with her first. What I will tell you very briefly, and I'm sure she'll do the same, is that um, I've lived in Los Angeles for 20 years. I'll tell my story in a second, and have been um, have sort of w one thing to say to start, which is that this notion of like Hollywood or this notion of entertainment or film is in many ways anachronistic. I think to why Bianca and I wanted to talk today, which is the business we're in is culture, it's sports, it's media, it's entertainment. It's far bigger than the traditional notion of Hollywood or something like that. I've never really used that term in quite some time. Uh, and so what we hope today is to talk about kind of how we got here and, and what we know about the industry and, and really how you know Yale has connected us in some ways and did not prepare us in others. But to have a frank conversation, we care about the school. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's all 
rainbows and sunshine when you talk about places in which we we didn't benefit or that you know Yale didn't prepare us for certain things. So um, with that intro, um, I'll start Bianca, uh, which is just give us you know to 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 steal Stephanie's question, but tell us where you are um, and what you do. And, and then if you don't mind starting, I guess, with Yale or maybe a little bit before how you got there. And then I'll, I'll if you ask me, I'll do the same. If not, I'll keep asking questions. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everyone. So I, uh, I'm currently a partner at a law firm in LA called Gang Tire, Raymer, Brown and Passman, and I'm an entertainment lawyer. So I represent, I mean, entertainment media broader, but I represent um, primarily talent in the film and television <coughs> industry and in their pursuits that have, you know, extended past those, uh, that industry in which they generally have started. Um, so I negotiate deals on a daily basis for talent and whether they're doing a film or a TV series or an endorsement deal or deciding to then write a book or, a brand partnership, the building out. I mean, you know, we talked about, uh, Stephanie mentioned my client, The Rock, who, um, you know, has has expanded his business to include things like a tequila brand and uh, an energy drink and all sorts of other things. So um, when you're representing talent at the top levels, like I've been fortunate enough to do, um, you know, you, you really get to go into a lot of sort of other parts of the the industry as well. So that's what I do and my path to, to getting here. Um, you know, I started at Yale, and went to Yale for college and law school, but I am a weirdo and decided I wanted to be an entertainment lawyer when I was 14 years old. Like didn't really know what it was, but had a friend that mentioned that they had an uncle that was an entertainment lawyer. And um, that just stuck in my head because as a child, like I loved watching TV and film. I would stay up all night and just was a massive fan. Um, and I tried my hand at acting when I was a child, but it really wasn't my thing. I was like a nerd. I liked the analytical side of things. And so when I heard there was something called an entertainment lawyer where I thought, oh, wow, I could kind of combine my love of entertainment with something a little more nerdy, like being a lawyer that like spoke to me. So it stuck in my head, didn't really know what that meant, but it's kind of, you know, what I, uh, what I focused on and, uh, Yale always intrigued me mostly because I knew as a child about the amazing actors that had come out of the school. And so, um, you know, went through my time Yale undergrad, loved it. It's the only school I ever wanted to go to. I applied early, I got in and it was my dream. And it was um, an amazing experience for me. Uh, I, like I said, I kind of already knew what I wanted to do, but being at Yale, it didn't, I, I, it, I can't say it helped me kind of figure out what an entertainment lawyer was any better than I'd known going in. Um, because I think at Yale, there were sort of two different groups. There was like the theater, the theater world, and that was heavy, but I, I didn't really fit into that world. And then there was the kind of film department, which, you know, was more filmmaker focused. So I didn't necessarily fit in there, but I knew that I had the strong interest in somehow figuring out how the business side worked. Um, and so I did that through internships in the summer. I, I interned at Sony Music in New York. Um, every summer. And that's where I kind of got a taste of, of, uh, you know, working in, in, in the business. Um, and, and Bianca, before I, before I jump in, I just want to make a point. I'm, I'm a lawyer by background, um, though I haven't practiced in a very, very long time. Um, but I don't think I understood, and I'm sure there are people on the Zoom, I know there are, who come from the sports media entertainment business, and there are others who don't. What is very atypical of an entertainment lawyer, and I say this as someone who worked at the largest, you know, tied for the most prominent talent agency for 12 years, the lawyers really control it, right? So, you know, when I was a corporate attorney, I was working with a sea of, of, of clients uh, and often internal counsel. But in your business, Bianca, and I'd love you to just explain it as the beginning is like, there is no layer 
between you and Dwayne. There is no layer between you or your other clients. Like you are the partner and there is no investment banker. There is no accountant. You're the business person. And, you know, the, the scary thing about that is, and I'm sure there's stories you can tell is they just assume you know what you're talking about. And the truth is, is often we don't. Uh, and so I want to make the distinction because to me, being an entertainment lawyer is in many ways being a partner and an entrepreneur. So I know you're going to throw it back at me because I could keep throwing it at you, but maybe yeah. you can comment on that. Um, no, it's so, I think that's, that's a great point. I mean, it's a team sport, I would say, and like representing talent as an entertainment lawyer, I work alongside, they have, you know, an accountant, an agent, like we all have our different roles, but the lawyer tends to be. Um, I mean, we're usually the only lawyer in talent life. And so um, it, it comes with a great responsibility. And I, I don't, you know, I, I am not an expert in, ever, in any and everything, but we, you know, the way I work, I still tend to be, I'm the client's touch point for all things business related. And I'm generally like quarterbacking, bringing in corporate counsel when necessary for this kind of deal and, you know, tax uh, tax advice over here, like, cause I'm not a tax lawyer. So I kind of quarterback everything for my clients lives in terms of how their businesses, um, are, are handled. And you're right. Like uh, the reason I wanted to be an entertain a talent lawyer specifically, as opposed to working on the, the corporate side, like working at a studio was, that I really love the personal interaction with my clients and with talent that I respect and admire. Um, and so I, we do, it's a very personal relationship with, with talent and very close relationship. And so that's what kind of makes it, that's what makes it really fun and exciting and the access and, and influence is, you know, can be great. But I wanna hear about you, Brian, and how, you yeah. transitioned because your path was a little different than mine and that you started as a lawyer and segued out of it. So would love to hear more about that. I couldn't get a job as an entertainment lawyer. So I was stuck. I was stuck doing that. Well, first of all, I want to thank Stephanie for giving me a promotion because she called me the CEO of Bad Robot. JJ Abrams and his wife, Katie, are the co-CEOs. I look forward to, to getting that promotion. Stephanie, I could use your help. <laughs> But uh, right now I'm stuck with president and COO of the company working for two great, you know, founding partners who happen to be an extraordinary married couple. Um, so, uh, look, I can tell you something about my path, which is that I had no desire to be in this business whatsoever. Um, when I got this job about four and a half years ago, um, the joke with my family is, when are you going to tell them you don't like sci-fi? Um, when are you going to tell them those are not the things you watch? And there's not completely true, but this was not the path that I expected. Um, I would have, I mean, I'm very, very into politics and civil rights issues and social justice issues. I would have thought that life would have taken me into sort of, I was a lawyer in New York, that it would have taken me into probably some world of private equity and finance where my time would be spent in and around other issues that I care quite a bit about. Um, but something happened along the way, which I didn't plan for, which is that I met someone who I loved, who was from Los Angeles. Um, and when I met my wife, who was also a scouting lawyer, she said to me, you know, we're going to move back to LA someday. And she had left LA because of all the annoying agents and people she knew who she grew up with. Um, you know, she was like all these subpar people in there, you know, running around acting like idiots in LA. So she moved to New York to meet a boring, straight laced person. And, and that was me. She said, we're going to move. I said, there's not a chance we're going to move. I'm so connected in New York. I know everyone. About six months later, we moved. Um, and um, that began, you know, a, a constant theme in my life. And when I got there, uh, she introduced me. And I knew I wanted to leave law. That was just not, my personality was, was not right for that. Um, and uh, I did, and I remember to this day, I literally was, when I was in my late 20s, I took maybe 50 get to know you meetings or calls when I moved to LA. And I remember every person, including some Yale alums who were not particularly nice. Uh, now they don't know that I remember, but I do. Uh, and uh, one of the people that I met was a remarkable guy named Brian Lord, who was a big Hollywood agent and he's a really wonderful guy if anyone knows him. 
Um, but Brian, in addition to being a massive talent agent, was on the board of IAC and a bunch of other companies. So I said, I want to meet him. I found my way into his office, uh, had a get to know you meeting. And because I didn't want to be in the entertainment business and because I had no uh, sense of, of his importance or a desire to, to follow in his footsteps, I did what you should, you should either always or never do in a get to know you meeting, which is I just said, I just acted like myself. I said, I don't understand. You have this agency. Why aren't you in the sports business? Why haven't you raised money? Why aren't you in all these other things? And he turned to me and he said, um, well, what are you doing tonight? Because I was, I was available and I went to dinner with him and his partner. And I went home to my wife that night. And I said, these two crazy agents just offered me a job. Um, I have no idea what I'm talking about. And she said, you're not from LA. Um, that's a really good thing. You should, you should say yes. Now I had a competing job offer, Bianca, from uh, a fund uh, in LA. And I thought, no, no, I'm gonna go to the fund. She said, you're not from LA. Uh, you need to take the CA job. So I called the fund, I turned them down and um, I accepted this job at CA. And the trade-off is that that fund owned 17% of Twitter at the IPO. And I, but I know a lot of famous people. So I probably lost about $150 million in that trade, but who's counting. Um, uh, and from there, I jumped into this entertainment industry. And this is something I think that is the benefit of the Yale education. The level of incompetence within our, within our business is extremely high. And the level of EQ and personality in a good way is high too. And so what I found was, oh my gosh, I was surrounded by such brilliant people in college. I was surrounded by such brilliant people in law school and at my law firm. And for the first time I was like, I can do this. So cut to 12 years at Creative Artists Agency where I ran a bunch of businesses, including corporate finance and strategy, which led me into falling in love with the business of creativity. Um, and I look forward to talking about that. And I found two wonderful people in JJ and Katie who had built an amazing company long before I arrived with a desire to really build something very, very significant. And we've grown exponentially in that time. So I did not intend to be here. I certainly didn't intend to, to be within this kind of industry, but it turned out to be a great left turn in my life. Um, so we have some great, so Bianca, if I can um, look at some, I mean, I think we have a ton of questions, yeah. but, but, and we're gonna, we're gonna put you on the spot at some point and ask you to, to talk, but I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump in first with one last question. I, I did prepare Bianca for this, as you know, you're a Yale Law person. That I assume that means you're really smart, and by my experiences with you, you are. Um, but tell me about the first time you really felt like, wow, I'm really in this crazy business, and 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 some of your experiences around. You know, part of it is we do have fun jobs and fun lives. So I wanted to tee you up for that. Um. I, I guess I'll tell one funny story. When I first transitioned from immediately out of law school, I was a corporate lawyer because everyone kind of told me the talent boutiques, which I knew I wanted you know, to be on the talent side, the talent boutiques never hire people straight from law school. You have to go to a big firm, get trained, and then like try to lateral over. So that's what I did. I spent two years in New York at like, you know, big Wall Street firm. And then ended up through a Yale alum um, get it, finding the, my job at, at Gang Tire, where I've now been for 17 years. But when I first started 17 years ago, like having come off of doing, you know, M&A deals and being up all night in the printers, I all of a sudden was working on Dwayne Johnson's contracts and Steven Spielberg's contracts and things like that. And, and it was, uh, you know, quite a big shift. So in my first year as a young baby lawyer, I, I was in the background working on these contracts, but hadn't really met the clients, didn't know them, was just sort of like learning the job and doing the work in the back office. Um, I ended up someone, a friend said, we should go to this, like this was back when I'm dating myself, the MTV Movie Awards was like the big thing. And it was always oh, here in LA. Really Bianca, you're really dating yourself. I'm like, are they still even around? I don't know. But back then it was a very big deal. And, uh, and, and I was a nobody in this business. No one was inviting me to the awards or to the parties. And all of the big agencies would have these parties. And there was like UTA was having a big party. It was at Chateau Marmont, like a very cool venue. And someone said like, I can get you into this party. Like you should go. And so I went and they could not get me into the party. And I ended up having to like 
talk my way into this party by dropping a name of one of my partners at the time. Uh, and I ended up getting into this party, but didn't know anyone. It's kind of wandering around like, you know, don't know anything. And I look over and I see Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, my client that I didn't know at that point had just like marked up his agreements. Um, and my friend like urged me like, go introduce yourself to him. And I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. Like he would, you know, I didn't want to bother him. I was like, just a baby lawyer. I finally did go. And, uh, and honestly, it sort of changed the trajectory of my career because he not only, I mean, he stopped talking to everyone he was talking to, like made such a big deal of, you know, meeting me and like, knew obvious like knew who i was but had not had not uh met me was the best and we just ended up connecting very well like personally um and that was kind of we just you know had an easy and direct rapport from that point on it's a client that i ended up sort of inheriting within my firm and i don't think i ever would if i hadn't snuck into a party and kind of <laughs> directly introduced myself and developed my like own relationship with him uh, as a very baby lawyer. So that was my uh, start in the business kind of funny story. What about you, Brian? You must have a million. Uh, I'm going to give two. One is sports and one is kind of traditional film and entertainment. So my very first day at CAA, um, I had come like you as a, from a corporate lawyer and um, they really didn't know at that time um, you know, the difference between a JD or an MBA, literally it was a, a firm that's grown quite a bit. And so when they hired me, they just sort of threw me into the middle of the run business development. And literally my first meeting was like a Monday at 10 a.m. And a guy named Richard Lovett is the president of CAA. And they've grown this into this very big business. Just said, hey, we have this meeting. So I said, where are we going? And, and I like literally had never done any of this. I had no idea what I was doing. And um, he said, we're going to go to, we're going to go see Tom Hanks. And this was kind of at the moment, it's a while ago. So it was like Saving Private Ryan, like really like Tom Hanks epic time. And we go to his office and we sit down and they go around the room and I'm, you know, 33 and I've never like met a famous person this way. And uh, Richard says, okay, everybody introduce themselves. And they get to me and Richard says, you know, it's actually Brian's first day on the job. Um, uh, and uh and so Tom looked over and he said, okay. And I said, well, you know, I was this and that. And he, and he goes, and he, he kind of starts to get bothered by the fact that I'm talking and I'm introducing myself. And he said, wait a second, is this your first, this is your first day on a job and you're, you're meeting with me? And I said, well, yeah. And, and he said, is, is this your first meeting? I said, this is my first meeting in the entertainment business. And he got kind of angry. And then he turned and he goes, oh, really? He goes, go get me a ham sandwich right now. And sort of stunned silence. And you know what you realize is the client is really always right in the entertainment industry and nobody says anything. And all of a sudden Tom Hanks throws his head back in laughter and all the agents in the room right on cue, 10 seconds later, start laughing too. And I'm just in stunned silence. Um, and I was at that moment, I realized, gosh, I'm going to be behind the eight ball. So that was that was hour one of my entertainment career. Um, and then I think the first moment where I sort of saw the magic of it all was, for those of you who are soccer or football fans, David Beckham came to L.A. Um, a while ago. And um, this was my early, early days. And um, he was represented by a music agent at CAA. Uh, who was friends with the uh, with a guy named Simon Fuller, who's the creator of American Idol, who is David's UK-based agent. And so they were bringing over the most famous football player, maybe tied for first athlete in the world at the time. And there was a music manager and music agent at the center of it. And so they, I had just arrived and they called me and they're like, you got to get in the middle of this. Like, we like, don't know what we're doing. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I, I know a lot about sports, but I have no idea. So I jump in the middle and like Bianca, I took good notes and, you know, I believed in doing a good job. And, you know, a couple of weeks pass and we get on the, on the call and the CEO of the, of the, the team was the LA galaxy is on the phone and, and all the representatives are on and they sent out the press release to the entire group. And it says, David Beckham signs $250 million deal to come to the LA Galaxy. And I look at the 
press release and go back to my notes and it's not even close. I mean, it's not even close to $250 million. And I, I'm like, well, what do I do here, Bianca? Like, do I like raise my hand like the good, you know, Yale student I am, or do I just let this go? Because how you can't put out a press release that's not accurate. We don't do those things. So I said, um, excuse me, guys. Um, I don't know. And they said, no, no, no. If you, if you count this and you count that and you multiply, yeah, it's, you know, it's give or take. And I was like really stressed. I mean, you know, nervous about it. I had no power to change it. They put out the press release, front page of the New York Times, every newspaper in the world, David Beckham signs $250 million deal. And I remember talking to Simon and Tim Laiwicki, who, who was the CEO of AG at the time. And they're like, nobody checks. It's all about positioning. Welcome to show business. Um, and it was a great moment, I'll always remember. And they were right and I was wrong. So those are my two moments that took me out of my normal, you know, get a good grade in class life um, to here. So Bianca, thank you for asking me that question. Um, so um, I think Bianca and I will jump into the questions. And if you don't wanna jump in, just let us know and we'll read it. But uh, Julie, um, and I wanna make sure I pronounce last names, D-I-L-L-E-M-U-T-H. Um, had a question here. Julie, do you want to pop on and ask if you don't mind? Um, sure. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Uh, this is really great to hear from you. Um, so my question is for Bianca. And how do you decide to take on a client? Um, I know typically, like at your level, you would get referrals probably. Um, but since it's sort of this like partnership kind of thing, there must like, do you have to make sure you kind of mesh well together or you have the same, like, how do you decide how you're going to work with a client? Um, before you take them on? Um, that's a good question. It's, it's not, you know, an exact science. It's sort of like uh, a lot of it is chemistry um, and my belief in their like proven talent because they're already, you know, I, I sometimes will sign talent that are already, have already made it, let's say in the business. And sometimes I sign people that are on their way up because I really believe in them um, because I'm a fan, because, I believe in the team that they have around them and where I think they can go because I like them as a person and believe in what they stand for. I, I have a lot of um, sort of interesting activist clients that I really just believe in and may not, you know, turn into the, the, the biggest money makers for me, but I, I love what they stand for and what they're doing. Um, so it's kind of a variety of things that come together to have it make sense for me. I mean, there are but so many hours in the day and I work a lot and I take every client that I take on, like I take it very seriously, whether it's Dwayne Johnson or a baby client that's just starting. So I do have to be very careful about um, not taking on too much. Uh, and so I, I have to be selective in that process, um, but yeah, it's sort of a mixture of a little bit of this, a little bit of that for it all to kind of that chemistry to come together and, and for that to work. Hey, Bianca, can I, can, I, can I put you on the spot and you can, avoid, you can avoid this truly if you can, but it's gonna be a nice thing. Um, in that journey of defining who your clients are, can you give us an example of someone who wasn't a big giant, like an activist or a client who you've, you know, something that worked out? I won't ask for the ones that didn't. So I'll be nice, but yeah, but something that <laughs> there are many that didn't. But um, but no, like I mean, I will talk about. There's one who's done very well now. Uh, uh, she's a director and producer. Her name is Melina Matsukas. She made an incredible film called Queen and Slim. Um, she directed the pilot of Insecure and, you know, produced that series for all five seasons. She's incredible. And I was a fan of her. She started out as a music video director and she directed a lot of Beyonce videos, Lemonade. She directed Rihanna, We Found Love. Like, I just loved what she did visually. Um, and so I was connected to her and told we had an amazing me all together. And I said, well, when you decide to, you know, transition to film and TV, I want to be your lawyer. And she was very picky in terms of like making that jump to film and TV. She wanted the right project. So, but she said, you know, when I, when I do, like, I will find you and we will work together. Cut to probably five years later, I would maybe run into her once every other year. 
five years later, she decided to sign on to direct the uh, Insecure TV pilot, and she found me. And we've been working together ever since. And she is just an incredible talent as a Black woman in this industry, really active and vocal about issues facing women and people of color in the business. And I just I feel incredibly proud to work with her. So that's probably one that, you know, I took a chance on in the beginning. It really, it really worked out. And, and she's just someone I'm, I'm proud of and love as a person, as a talent. Right. So um, I think, uh, and we'll go to some other questions, but I think uh, Daniel Gessmer wrote in and can't go on camera. So I will read the question. Um, and I think it's, a, it's good after Bianca's answer. Um, uh, how has your cynicism to optimism ratio evolved as you've moved deeper and deeper into the entertainment business? So I'll actually start with that. Um, I'm more optimistic about what we do for a living than I ever expected to be. It is so not about, you know, some, we can make fun of kind of a notion of Hollywood or celebrity or something, but I actually am inspired by it all the time. I think whether it's actors who years ago would have waited for an agent to call with a job, starting new businesses, um, launching new ventures, doing the hard work that it takes, or people using their platform to tell stories. I mean, in my day job at Bad Robot, I'm so proud of the things that we put out into the world. Um, and whether it's, you know, a, a female Jedi, which is, which is intentional in its goal, but not preachy, or, or whether it's um, the show we had this past summer called Lovecraft Country on HBO, which was a limited series, which we love so much. You're proud to be able to put things into the world and work with creative partners you believe in. I mean, I literally, and I know that, that Bianca does this too, I will just find people who I think are interesting or, or inspiring, like anyone, and just call them. Like a CEO, a politician, a playwright, an actor, like just call an athlete and just say, what stories do you want to tell? Um, and the great news is they respond mostly. Um, and you get to ask and have those conversations at those lunches. And so I actually think, you know, and, and I and I and I don't feel good about, you know, I think that that in New Haven or on the East Coast, the the Yale perspective might be that it's sort of silly or frivolous. It's not, it's just not, you know. It's, it, I feel better about it than I ever have. And I'll sort of say it this way. Um, one of the most annoying people in the world is like a 28, 29 year old in LA who just moved and is like starting to know famous people. Like they're super annoying. And like everything that you want them to not be, that's who they are. Like they have an expense account, they're running around, they're acting like knuckleheads. But then you settle into life and you have someone you love and you have relationships and you have children and you have responsibilities. And then you just go to work and it normalizes into everything else. And you go like, you know, is it, I could do other things in my life, but I get to, I get to choose to do things that I enjoy that I would do in my spare time. Um, and so for me, I'm, I'm surprised at the optimism I feel. I'm surprised of the respect I have. Cause when I was in New Haven, when I was at Yale, I would have looked at, at this industry in the opposite way. So Bianca, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but that's my answer. Um, no, I think I think you answered it well, and I'm 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 right there with you. What about? I think there's a good question here for you that maybe as a follow up, if Sakina, maybe hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, wants to ask that question of Brian. Hi, I'm Sakina. Hi, Sakina. Can you all hear me and see me? Perfect. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so I, I related to your experiences, Brian, in that I've had a less direct path in my career. I had interest in social issues. And so I've become a Yale China fellow. I've lived all over the world to try to tell stories about globalization from personal experience. And now I'd like to be able to tell those stories and have a greater impact. Do you think that it's best to try to network? Should I focus on creating the perfect story first? Do you have any insights about that? Um, I will answer. Sakina, thank you for that question. Where do you live, just so I understand where you're now? I'm about an hour outside of New York City. Okay. Because um, that's part of the answer, I think, to give advice. Mm -hmm. um, well, so within your question, you said something that I would, I jumped on, I heard right away, which is, should I wait to tell the perfect story? No, there is no perfect story. It's impossible. Everything is a first draft. Everything is a first take. 
Um, and so don't wait for the perfect. And one of the hard parts about being someone who went to a really good college is you sort of don't want to turn in the B plus paper. You don't want to, you don't want to fail. And like, this is just a messy, difficult business and you cannot wait for perfection. Like we would literally never start a film or television show, a song, a video game, the things that we make if we waited for that. Um, and the advice that I gave at CA and I still give today to people aspiring to be in it is you'll literally meet brilliant people who are like, I want to be a writer. And my advice to them is then write. Like, you know, and it's a very, I want to be a filmmaker, make something. Um, let, the, let the act of making make you better. Because like if, you know, across the hallway, I'm in the office uh, right now, is JJ's office. And, you know, what he wants to do is, sure, he wants to talk to an aspiring filmmaker about their film, but he really just wants to watch it, right? And if you're a writer, our executives here, they'll be charmed by meeting you, but they just want to read it. Um, and so it's so hard to get into that mode. Um, and then once you've done that, then the networking, the connectivity, there's something to, to, to show up with. That, that is more than the thing you're going to do. And it's really hard because you don't have the resources, you know, once you make it in quotes, whatever that means, you'll have money and resources and stuff to make it better. And now it's just, it's, it's the sort of conviction of your own, um, in your own self to go out there. So I now I know, um, Bianca, you'll have something to add to that too, because I'm certain you get that from aspiring clients and others. Yeah, I mean, for sure, I agree. It's. Uh... It's hard for me. I am like such a perfectionist. I, I think I try not to give too much advice to people on the cre creative side. It's just not my forte. But I, I definitely, I would say the opposite though, for people that, as Brian said, want to be on the business side of this business. Um, like actually, I love how Brian, you said like the level of incompetence, like shocked you. Um, and I think that is true. There are so many people that like operate on the business side of things that don't really know what they're doing and are in it for the glitz and the glamour and like the access to celebrity and don't learn how to do their jobs very well. And those people peter out, I think pretty quickly. Um, they definitely don't rise to the top. And so I would say for on the business side, like on the opposite of just, I mean, yes, get out there and just do it, but really learn your craft. Like take it serious. I take my job very seriously. Like you don't get to operate at this level and like just to go to the premieres and have that kind of fun part of the job. Like this is a, a, a very serious and lucrative business in terms of like the industry and the brands that we're building with our clients and like, you know, take it seriously, learn your craft, do your, do your job. Okay, it sounds like I'm on the right track. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. So, so Brian and Bianca, I'd like to call on uh, Jeff Locker uh, because he happens to be the current president of the uh, Shared Interest Group, Yale and Hollywood. And yes. even though you talked about, you know, Hollywood as a sort of catch-all is kind of dated, I, I, I think Yale and Hollywood is more kind of a, it, it's not just, Hollywood base, but go ahead and ask your question, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Correction, I'm vice president, uh, actually. Oh, okay. Kevin Winston. <laughs> you're very generous. Thought, okay, I'm just. <laughs> yeah. uh, Kevin Winston is, is, is president. And Kevin, I think Kevin is here, He's here too. as well. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. And, and thank you so much to Brian and uh, Bianca for, for doing this. A, a part of the work that we try to do with Yale and Hollywood, which, by the way, if you're interested, find us on the internet. Uh, is is to try to foster more community. Uh, obviously, Yaleys who are in entertainment around the world, but certainly in Los Angeles and New York. Um, so, uh, so a lot of the questions that we get, uh, specifically for people trying to break into the business, is how how can I use the Yale network uh, to find not only like minded individuals, but people who have ach achieved a certain level of success. And, and we're all so weird about that sometimes. Like we just want to like do it all on our own, but like nobody does anything on their own, which is part of the part of the journey. So um, I guess this question originally started out uh, for, for Bianca, uh, specifically for creatives. One of the things that I learned is is we think, oh, we have to immediately get an agent or we have to immediately get a manager. And I've, especially for the go-getters, I've heard several people say, you know, you could actually just go through a lawyer first 
especially if you already have a project. And sometimes lawyers will actually refer you to clients that they work with who might be a better rep for you than say a lot of us query hundreds of people hoping somebody will respond. So specifically, I guess, Bianca and, and Brian, you can talk to this as well. How do you, what advice do you give for people who are ready to kind of move to that level as in people who have already done projects or they've already, they have several pilots and they're kind of, they want to take advantage of the Yale network to maybe go about it a different route. I think I'm, I'm there's a lot of words, but I think you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I think um, definitely reaching out to the network. When I was an undergrad, like I, I mean, and just my personality in general is not to just, I, I was very much thought this was like all a meritocracy and I was just going to work really hard and be really smart. And that was going to be enough. Like it was just going to, I was going to figure out how to, you know, rise yeah. the ranks, but I think you're right. Like no one ever does it alone, especially this business is very relationship driven. So, you know, alumni networks, I think can be very helpful if you use them effectively to reach out to people and try to connect, try to get advice. I wouldn't necessarily, you know, say for representation. I mean, it, like, it, you know, d who people sign as clients, like for me as a lawyer, um, you know, it's, as I explained, like, it's not, uh, it's, I don't often get clients just from um, a cold call from a piece of talent. Like it generally doesn't work that way. It usually comes a little bit more baked by the time it, it makes its way to me. But reaching out for general advice, at least, and, you know, connections, and maybe if like, I'm not the lawyer, I know someone else that might be right to help depending on the stage that the person is at. All of that is is important and like definitely a useful skill that I think um, I didn't know how to really do as a young, you know, as a college student, for sure. I, I had no clue how to do that, how to make that work for me. Um, and then and not just, you know, figuring out after you even make that initial connection, how to be thoughtful about staying in touch. Like we are busy people. And I find like the people that I have like mentored and really like they found ways to be creative about staying in touch with me, even if we have like an initial 20 minute, like great, you know, meet and greet, like it's, it's finding those ways to stay top of mind um, in, you know, that has been really helpful, I think. So, so I'm going to jump in, you know, Jeff and Kevin have done such a great job and for a long time, consistently building, you know, Yale and Hollywood and, you know, we need to support them and do more. And it's such an important resource. Um, so we're going to go to sort of a speed round because there are actually, which is wonderful, there's quite a bit of questions. So Bianca, I'm just going to read from the top down. And it, I think some of these answers might be, I don't know, um, which makes it a quick answer, but we'll see where it goes. So I'll start first um, with Paul and I'll, and I'll read the question just for the sake of time, because I know that um, folks are, um, you know, have, have short time, but so Paul Vera asks, when I'm not doing my day job, I'm a composer, could you talk about the music aspect of the business and how artists and creators get connected to production managers and directors or decision makers? Um, it, very specific question, you know, we have music supervisors, um, you know, you have all these sort of like well-known names and directors, and ultimately that is quite a big part of our business because music is so important to shows. And it is a small group of music supervisors who are not, who do not get the recognition that they should get, um, who really put in front of a director or a producer, a set of music that they would, that they would suggest. So they're taking a sea of opportunity and calling it down into a set of songs and a set of music. And they're highly influential people. And so if you were going to laser target it, it wouldn't be about meeting the director or that it would be about getting your stuff in front of, you know, getting your work and your thoughts in front of music supervisors. So that's, that's my first, Bianca. I don't know if you see where I am in the chat, but do you wanna take the, I'm at 534 in the chat. Um, oh. Here was Jeff. So um, I'll do Rob Greenlee's Bianca, which is a fun question for you. Oh. I can't get two more different cities than New Haven, Yale and LA Hollywood. <laughs> what has it been like for you to be living in LA and how is it uh, to be a Yale in that far away place? Uh, I will say, well, similar to Brian, as a fellow New Yorker who has now lived in LA for 17 years or so, I, you know, it was very hard for me to even imagine moving to LA. In my head, I had these visions of like, it's going to be so superficial. It's this, it's that. And then, 
The truth is so many New Yorkers and Yaleys are transplanted out here that, you know, LA is, it's an amazing place to live. It's an amazing place to raise a family, which both Brian and I, you know, are doing too. And so, yes, very different, but also has become even, you know, since in the 17 years that I've been here, just more, uh, sort of more cosmopolitan, more, just more, even more interesting. And I, I love it. Now I will never go back to the East Coast permanently. Uh, I, I, I second that feeling. I think that the diversity of uh, the environment and, and, and the industry is, there's so much happening here. Plus the food's a whole lot better. And it is 85 and the Super Bowl's here this weekend. So don't make fun of LA, you East Coasters. Okay, so uh, keep going. One, Marcus and Julie both reminded me that Tom Hanks is still epic. And Marcus wrote that Tom Hanks gave the commencement speech. So that is true. I did not mean to say Tom Hanks was not still epic. Um, Marcus <laughs> also asked, Bianca, um, you mentioned having personal interest in the arts and common interest with your clients, The Rock. How do you work into your job, which, which is based, let me say this right. How do you work into your job, which at its base is providing legal advice, but understandably can be a lot more. So I guess the question is, how do you work your interest in the arts and your common interest with your clients into your job? That's Marcus's question. Marcus, if I got that wrong, just jump in here, please. Um, I think, I mean, look, as like, as I said, sort of, I, I'm just a fan of, film and television and creative people. And so for me, it is fun to be able to work with them and protect them and help build with them on the business side um, in a way where they feel so taken care of. They can focus on the creative side. Not a lot of my clients are super business minded. I mean, some of them are brilliant people like Dwayne who sort of have it all, but, uh, that's that's how I work at it. I mean, it's I, I love the people that I work with. It's all about you know the talent and finding interesting people. And then also for me as a black woman, like working with diverse talent and women and sort of correcting the years of inequity and sort of historical, you know, lack of opportunities and inequity and in deals that I'm able to now um, you know sort of fight and correct and champion. That is like my personal passion that gets really infused with my work and, and it, it's, it keeps me going. Um, so I'm gonna go out of order because I see a very, uh, a wonderful Yale family in the lower left corner of the Swintons. And so I'm gonna put them on the spot because you asked a great specific question. So um, though we got to race through, do you guys wanna ask your question and then we can answer? And it's nice to see um, uh, future Yaleys, hopefully, uh, on the soon too. <laughs> exactly, the pressure is on. So we said, um, so we're, you know, and I are, are both uh, class of 92, and we've got raising, actually, there's like three, three here. So here. <laughs> three kiddos, yeah. Alma, two um, who are working, Alexa was just, in, and just like that, and Maxime was recently seen in Halston. He'll be, you'll see him this fall in, um, in Fleischman's In Trouble, and in also in a feature film called The Gravediggers, where he was with Ethan Hawke and um, Ewan yeah. McGregor. But they're, um, they're, we've also got, you know, they're aspiring entrepreneurs. And an aspiring lawyer here. And that's point. right. And, yeah. and aspiring yeah. entrepreneurs. And I have a law degree as well. I went to NYU Law after Yale. Amazing. Yeah. Well, it's tough to, it's an, you guys are an impressive crew. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> nervous just hearing about this. But it's great. But it's, <laughs> yeah, but it's, just, some, yeah. it's great to hear perspectives because as they're growing the career and we're, you know, trying to help, it's like an entrepreneurial adventure for the whole family. But to get your perspective, as you guys have worked with people over their careers, you know, for young entrepreneurs in the industry, what advice would you have? Just, you know, how, how should they think about being entrepreneurs in this business, not just being talent? Um, just curious. We're curious to get your perspectives. Brian, you take this one for sure. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, the entertainment business and you guys have done, I mean, it's unbelievable what you've accomplished thus far, but you're going to get a lot of no's because everyone does. Um, and one of the hardest things about being really smart and based on your parents and based on what you've accomplished, all of you, I know that to be the case, is that you can't let the lanes of the industry control your career. So what does that mean? It's not about the agent. It's not about the studio executive. It's not about the lawyer. You have to go create the momentum yourself. It's the same, the same advice to be the writer. Like, if you, you know, it's, it's the moment that Matt Damon and Ben Affleck wrote their first thing that they could star. And it's like, don't, 
don't allow some, someone else will choose you or not choose you for a part, but ultimately, you know, you need to just keep pushing forward. So I would say, find the things you love, find the things that are authentic to you and push for them alongside the incredibly frustrating until you get, until you get that moment process of being rejected. And you're, it's incredibly brave what you're doing because you're putting yourself out there. And so you, you have to be prepared for that. Um, but don't let that define you. Write the thing you want. Focus on the top. Go after the story you love. Um, and, and that is the entrepreneurship. Because if you think someone else is going to make it for you, we're really good at taking someone from like sort of famous to really famous. You know what's hard? Getting from zero to sort of. And that's what's gutsy. So it's amazing you are where you are. When you have those moments, ignore them, move on, be depressed, and then wake up the next day and find the thing you love. But there's like literally no actor I've ever met or no creator I've ever met that doesn't have those incredibly difficult moments. And my advice as a former lawyer um, to an aspiring lawyer is, um, you know, jump in as quickly as you can, you know, whatever path it is, whatever your topic is. And if it is in entertainment, and Bianca did it pretty early, like a lot of people come to it late you know, go, go, go for it right away. So that's my quick answers on a much bigger group Zoom to your, to your family. And someone asked, and I'm, I, I saw it at one point, but now I've lost it. And maybe I can combine this with another question I just read. Um, someone asked, do you have to be a lawyer? If you want to break into this business, like we're both lawyers, Brian, and do different things, you have to go to law school. My answer is no, please don't waste your time or money in law school if you do not want to be a lawyer. I, most people on the business side of things here did not. I have friends that, you know, went to law school, worked for several years as a, you know, at law firms and then decided they wanted to be an agent and they had to start at the bottom and be an assistant making, you know, $16 an hour or whatever it was back then. Um, and that... I just think there are other ways to go about it. If you if you don't want to be a lawyer, I wouldn't I wouldn't go that route. Right. Bianca, um, I think the person that asked that question is Miles. Is that right? And I think Miles is actually your current student. Yes, I'm a junior undergrad. So um, I think you had another part to that question because um, I think you know I think can can you ask uh, your question about um, well, can you ask your other, other parts of your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, just what type of junior positions or internships um, should I be looking for right now? What's your, what's your, so Miles, you're a junior, what, what's your, not, it doesn't, it's, it, this is an irrelevant question. I'm just curious, what's your major? Does it, uh, does economics. It? Um, I mean, it depends on what you want to do. So, you know, absolutely don't go to law school for the purpose of doing something else. Go to law school if you want to be a lawyer. We agree with that. You know, if this is a big thing and, a, you know, I, I'm happy to, you can email me or something, but it's like, what, uh, you know, I want to be a studio executive. I want to be on the creative side. I want to be in the producing side. I mean, there's 17,000 jobs. So the only real answer we could give you to that question would be like, what do you want to do? And if, you know, you tell us, we can give you some guidance and point you in a bunch of perspectives. And certainly, you know, Jeff and Kevin and the team there will have a lot to say, I'm sure about that. But um, yeah, you know. internships. I mean, I when I was an undergrad, I worked at Sony Music in New York. I literally looked and I bought like an internship Bible, like they I probably still have them. It was like this big. And I looked at, <laughs> narrowed it down to looking for entertainment internships in New York um, that paid because I needed, you know, to be paid in the summer because I could not afford to just do a free internship. And the only one I found, there was one at Sony Music that was specifically to targeted towards um, people of color. And I applied for that and ended up loving it. And even though now I don't specifically work in the music industry, it really gave me a sense of what the business of music was. I got to intern in like international marketing. And then I sort of my, my third summer there, I was um, even as an undergrad interning in the kind of legal department, which they didn't you know, usually allow people to do, but it really gave me a sense of how a record label worked. And I, it, it was fun. And I got to see like all of these jobs that I never knew existed. So there are internships at studios, 
at you know agencies at all of these places. That's good. If you don't know, by the way, like if you're not quite sure, any of the agencies just give you a bird's eye view of of what's possible. Yeah. Um, okay. We have a lot of messages. I know we we Bianca. I think we were gonna maybe push an extra couple five to ten minutes, and people can jump off as they as they may, if that's okay. Um. um what about Fred Cantor? I'm just trying. Right. There are so many, but I'm so I'm skipping around. I'll just see Fred Cantor asked a question about do you still stay in touch with some of your former classmates and do those friendships play any kind of role in your current or recent work? Um, because he mentioned they've they've played a big role in his his life. Um, do you want to answer that, Brian? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're all we're all part of the same team here. You know, honestly, no not to the level that I wanted to. Yale, you know, I have extraordinary friends from Yale, but on the business side, um, it hasn't been, what's helpful is that when you say you went to Yale, it obviously creates a, you know, incredible level of, they, you know, there's an assumption that you're a smart human being and that you work hard. And we have a bunch of Yale people who work at Bad Robot, but from a business perspective, it, it hasn't been, um, the tool that I wished it had been. I actually think it that needs to change. I'm committed to being a part of that change. Um, on the other hand, um, one of my best friends is this extraordinary guy named Ezra Edelman who won an Academy Award for the OJ doc. And he was my roommate at Yale. And like, I don't care about the Academy Awards, but when he won, I cried like a baby as did my the rest of my family. So, you know, on the one hand, no. On the other hand, maybe my proudest moment in this industry was when my 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 roommate uh, won the academy that I was so proud that he did. So, yeah, I would say same as Brian. I have a lot of amazing friends from Yale that I'm still friends with, but not necessarily in entertainment. Um, they just had other interests, and and I'm and you know I haven't found that like network here. But as Brian said, I think too, it's still it's a stamp of approval. It's a calling card, and you know I, I personally like I've. I have clients now that I sign that are Yale drama grads that I love. I love that like pedigree and we have that connection. Um, I, you know, represent Stacey Abrams and her kind of entertainment work, a fellow Yale law grad. And we definitely, I mean, I met her when I was an undergrad and trying to decide what law school to go to. And she was really good. She was in the law school at the time and a really good friend of, of a friend of mine who was a Yale undergrad grad as well. And so that connection, you know, I think it has definitely helped with clients and made that that sort of that connection. So that's been that's been nice. Um, I just want to point Kevin's posted some really helpful stuff um, about Yale and Hollywood to those who who want to have that information at the bottom of the chat. So I think we, we're going to take maybe like eight more minutes because I think we have a bunch more questions. Um, uh, oh, that's interesting. Marcos Martinez asks, and this is probably for you, Bianca, um, have you either experienced yourselves or seen with others where the Yale and law degrees were intimidating to the hiring side? Um, uh, I will say that I've seen, like I had one of my best friends from Yale Law School decided that she wanted to be a TV executive. And she was going to, this was after having worked at a corporate law firm after Yale Law School, and then sort of transitioning into entertainment law, and then thinking that she could go from becoming, being uh, an entertainment lawyer on the studio side, like a studio lawyer, to being a creative exec. And it was really hard for her. People did not want to hire, like she would have had to start from the bottom as like an assistant and work her way up. And people were sort of like, oh, how am I going to ask a... Yale law grad to like, you know, answer my phones and schedule for me and things like that. So, I, you know, that's kind of one example of it. But in general, I think it's still very respected and, and has been helpful more than help, hurtful. Right. There, there's a couple questions about sort of streaming and its impact on the business and our negotiations, which is a a fun business question to ask that's personal. I mean, I'll just, I'll give my version, Bianca jump in or, or however is, suits you. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the impact of streaming has been twofold. Um, one is there's a pro proliferation of the buying of content. And so that's good because there's just more. And, you know, if you look at the numbers five years ago, 
you have tens of billions of dollars that have that did not exist that are now going into the content production landscape only. That's the good news. The bad news is that the it used to be in this business that you know if you make something and it succeeds, it's like an asset. It's like a building. It it it, it compensates you over a very long period of time. And what the streamers figured out was let's just pay you up front and then you never participate in the future. Um, and that's a, mentally, that's a bummer. You put something out and you get paid once and then like you don't kind of care because you'll, you'll never get paid ever again other than creatively. And if you have something that's like truly special, sure, you know, it's so hard to make anything. It's like, a, it's a miracle when, <laughs> when a show comes together, like a miracle when these big shows. And so it's, it is, hard when hard is a it's a high class problem it's not as it's not as economically rewarding not even close when you do something that succeeds and what you get to do is make another season for a little bit more now the flip side of that all that and bad robot is a is a unique example that bianca works with other companies is that those companies that can really make things at scale we're one of them you know, are able to benefit a little bit from that insatiable appetite, but it's a complicated time um, and it's getting more complicated. Uh, and I think those people who are emerging, you know, it, it's hard because there's so much power uh, in a small subset of, of entities that we all watch and subscribe to. So that's my kind of quick answer to that. You've, you've, you've been uh, pumping out the good info pretty good here, in fact, uh, I, I, in fact, I think it, it might be even appropriate at this point that we just wrap things up for this evening and uh, maybe just ask you, you know, after going through all of those uh, probing, interesting questions, if you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave people with. Uh, yeah, I can go first. I mean, one, there was a question in here about, because I worked at an agency for 12 years about, um, what agent do I relate to? And I think it's very important, particularly in front of people from Yale, that though I worked in an agency, the biggest uh, insult you could give me would be to call me an agent. Bianca, is that a fair, a fair thing to say that I don't wanna be called an agent? Um, I was a business person. I ran strategy, I ran finance. I, have, I know lots of agents, many of them are my friends, but I've tried for a long time to remind people I'm a regular kind of boring business person. Um, and, uh, and the fun stuff you saw over the years on Call My Agent or Entourage, like I wasn't cool enough to get to do any of that ridiculously insane stuff. So, so that's my most important thing that I leave you with selfishly. Um, the other thing I'd say is, um, you know, it's honestly like a wonderful thing to be able to share this with everyone on this call. And, you know, for those who want, I know we'll, we'll I'll, I'll, I'm available. If anyone want, has specific questions about navigating things, but I'm grateful that I had the, had the chance to speak to to speak to everyone, Bianca. Same. I mean, this was fun to to do this, and I, you know, I wish Yale and Hollywood existed when I, when I was a student. It maybe would have helped me navigate it a little bit better. It sounds like there are a lot of resources out there for alumni and students that want to figure out pathways to finding people like Brian and me to help, you know, navigate this uh, world. Like we're we're you know, it's it's a great group, and we're here. And I love that we're creating more of a, a community. Steve, since you've, you've plugged in in our line, do you want to give a, a, a good plug for Cross Campus? Well, I'll just remind everybody that uh, we do have an online community that's quite vibrant and has 20,000 members of the Yale community on it, uh, roughly two-thirds alums and one-third students. And there have been uh, five or 10,000 unique connections on it. We urge you to join Cross Campus if you haven't. We have two mentorship programs on cross campus that have already paired 4,000 Yale students with 4,000 alums. So you too can be part of that. Great. Thanks so much, Brian. Thanks so much, Bianca. This has been fabulous. And um, we'll see, see the rest of you, uh, the party next week. <laughs>